Welcome to Beyond the Sermon. I am Pastor Wright Dave Brudat from Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Shirley. I'm joined with Pastor Will Triggered Harley, or Will Trigger Harley, or Will, uh, excuse me for the sound of my Harley, uh, who is here. And uh, also I'm here with the wrong Dave, Pastor Dave Endorf. He's the wrong Dave because uh, many, many years ago when my wife, who was not my wife at the time, was calling for Dave, Dave would say, here I am. And she would say, no, you're the wrong Dave. So for the members at uh, Brooklyn Park in Brooklyn Lutheran, at Brooklyn Lutheran Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, he's the right Dave. But for us, he's the wrong Dave. There you go. Welcome. This is beyond the sermon. We finally got it going. <laughs> Ten minutes in. <laughs> That's a record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, uh, if you if you're a first time listener to Beyond the Sermon, uh, we welcome you. And if you have listened before, you know that this is the time where we wane sort of philosophical on on all the things that we could have probably done better when we preached our sermons from this last weekend. Kind of giving you a, a a roundabout way of what we have studied and the things we've had to cut out, as well as uh, taking a look at at. Um, the basic law gospel that we presented from our sermons on Sunday. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to our sermons, um, I know mine you can find on YouTube, uh, Pastor Dave Rudot, right, Dave? Um, you can find his sermons on Shirley Cares. Uh, Emmanuel uh, so Shirley, Cares. Emmanuel Cares. Emmanuel Cares. Shirley Early is, Emmanuel we're not quite cares. sure about, but um, Emmanuel definitely does care. Surely Emmanuel, surely Emmanuel does care. Um, and so you can find it there on his Facebook page for the church as well as just on the Facebook page, right? On the website, website okay. EmmanuelShirley.com on any other podcasting platform. Yeah. It's his there. Is just much search more for Emmanuel Cares. You'll find it. And, and his is more approachable. Um, he, he has cut the entire service down to just the sermon just for you. Um, mine, you have to go through the confession and absolution, the prayers, the readings, and then you get to the sermon and then you have to stay for the rest. And so uh, we, we, mine's more of a time investment um, uh, for you. And Dave, Pastor Dave Endorf, what do you have? Do you have yours up anywhere? Yeah, our services are all on uh, YouTube. Brooklyn Lutheran has its own YouTube channel. So you're certainly welcome to go there and, and check them out. I'm awesome. not any better looking on YouTube than I am here. <laughs> when you, when you I, get to a certain level, yeah. I mean, you know. Both you and I have a uh, look for radio. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I, I don't know what you've all preached on. I know I preached on the Old Testament text uh, for uh, proper, what is that going to be? That's proper six, proper five, proper five. Second Sunday of Pentecost. Proper five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they, they had that new, the newfangled system that the they're number. working with. Uh, Dave, where did you, uh, what text did you preach on? I preached on the second lesson. Oh, you and I are in second, we're second lesson buddies for this week. There oh, you go. Nice. Well, since both of you started with the uh, second lesson, did you guys want to go first and talk about uh, no, your because, shared experience? No, we need to be. We need to you to lay the groundwork. We need you to, uh, you know, All right. trigger well, this whole conversation. I'm I'm good at laying groundwork. Uh, so I, uh, I of course preached on Exodus chapter three, and uh, it was one through fifteen, um, the call of Moses into his public ministry. Um, and so uh, I don't know if I'm going to go back and reread it. Uh, that would be 15 verses that that we really don't want to have to go through uh, and reread. But I would highly recommend going and reading it. Um, the focus of the Sunday, generally, um, um, a call to worship. So the the um, how Jesus calls servants into the kingdom to worship uh, and to to serve him. And so um, my focus was uh, overall theme, Jesus calls sinners. That, that was my theme, Jesus calls sinners. And um, my focus was, was really looking at um, kind of playing with Moses's question, who am I, uh, that I should go to Pharaoh, and, and kind of playing the backwards role of, of giving a, a brief introduction. You know, Moses was a slave born. Moses was uh, adopted to be, to be a prince 
Um, Moses was uh, attempting to be a hero. Moses ended up being a murderer. Moses then um, covers it up. Moses runs away. Uh, Moses becomes a, a lone shepherd, um, you know, trying to hide all of these things. And then, then the Lord comes and calls him. And as he's standing before the Lord, as he's standing before Christ in the burning bush, um, he has that moment where all of those sins come back. All of the, all of the things of who he wasn't or who he attempted to be and failed to be um, come back to him. And he, he uh, stands upon holy ground and he has to remove his, his sandals and he is afraid because he is a sinner in front of a very holy God and uh, um, he is rightfully, rightfully trembles. Uh, and then the Lord doesn't chastise him for all of his previous sins. The Lord says, I've come to deliver. I've seen my people. I've seen what's happened. I know what's going on. Um, and and he, he kind of now uh, turns and says, I've come to deliver my people and I'm going to send you to do this. And that brings up the question, right, um, where, where I kind of just played off that idea of, so you have Moses who is, is not ready to do this. He's not uh, equipped to do this. He is everything that he looks at and says, I shouldn't be, but yet the Lord is saying, I'm, I'm sending you to go. And um, <clears throat> how are we that way? So I, I, that's how I worked into my, my law section. Um, you know, maybe we haven't murdered somebody, but I said, you know, we've all hated someone. That's just a fact. We all have. Um, we've all tried to cover up our sins, just like Moses tried to cover up his sins. Um, and I and I said, you know, how many of you have lied? And I said, don't raise your hand. And and or I'm not even going to. I usually have class participation in a sermon, and I said, please don't try to raise your hand because I'm going to have to tell you that you're a liar because you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we asked that question: Who am I? And, and, and then I, I went to the gospel section. It doesn't, that's the wrong question. The question isn't who am I? It's who is he? Who is the one who calls? Who is the one who is, who is uh, bringing us into this ministry? And what are his promises? I will be with you. You will come with me. I'm going to do. I will give you the words to say. Um, and then I kind of ended the whole entire thing uh, with, with that idea of, you know, the Lord called a murderer who, you know, the Lord then will call an adulterer. And the Lord, um, in the New Testament, as we, we go forward, calls a tax collector who was an embezzler. Um, the Lord, in Paul, calls a blasphemer. Um, and I said, and then the Lord calls a uh, opinionated windbag to serve in Maribel. And uh, I said, it's all a matter of, of the one calling, not who he calls. So that's kind of my sermon. All right. Very good. Um you covered law and gospel on that. Uh, anything I, I you, did. anything your listeners want to ask about it? I don't. This know. is your turn to ask. This is your time to text something in the chat that was that is on your screen. I, I think while we're waiting, um, I, I'll just say one of the things that I could have focused on more, and I didn't, just because of the, I guess the overarching theme of the of Sunday was the, the name of the Lord, right? Um, this is the second person of the Trinity. He names himself. I am. Um, I, I really could have focused on that. Could have focused on the eternal nature um, that he is still currently the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Um, so. All right. All right, uh, Dave. Oh, now we have it. We have one. Uh, you're probably going to struggle strangle me because I'm always in left field. However, my focus on Sunday was even though I suck I'll, or do a lot of sucky things happen in my day to day, God is still using me. How will I know? How will I now look at situations oh. differently? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to say my life is different, but you know what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it makes things it makes things really difficult that it's not a matter of who I am, it's a matter of who's calling me and, mm -hmm. and he's working through me. So um yeah. It's very empowering, isn't it, that when you are looking back at your past and saying, Look at um how can I expect myself to change or be different 
than I was yesterday because that's who I am. And then you realize, oh, let's f- let's focus on who God is rather than who I am. And what what does He think of me? Well, because of Christ, He thinks of me as someone worthy of Him calling and worthy of of Him being active in my life, in my day to day life. So that uh, changes my perception of myself. Absolutely. And I I think picking up on that, you know, it should also change how we talk about ourselves. Um, you know, that, that when we talk about what we are as Christians, the Bible always talks about the Christian as being perfect, holy, and righteous. You know, we do things that are sinful, you know, but we are perfect, holy, and righteous. I should have put that in the sermon. I didn't. <laughs> it's okay. And, and I, um, you know, we were we're going through in our Tuesday Bible study Luther's large catechism, and so Luther, Luther picking up on Paul in um, First Corinthians seven, Romans seven. There we go. It talks about sin is being uh, roped around your neck, you know, and it's still with you, but it's not you, you know, and so it's the the sin living in me, sin, mm. you know, and. Yeah, it's it's a good distinction to remember. You are not your sins. You are baptized. Yeah. Well, when you were studying Exodus, I just had this thought as we were talking as Dave was talking about who you are. Like we are righteous and holy. Um when God tells Moses to take his sandals off, is that in humility, or is that in you, Moses, are holy? You don't need to cover up who you are. Come on to this ground with your dirty feet, because your dirty feet are holy and perfect, because I've declared them to be. Yeah, um, you know, there's a, that is a beautiful picture where, <clears throat> where you have the very ground um, is made holy because of the Lord whose presence is there. Um, and then by his presence, he's making um, Moses holy. Um, and, 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 yeah, and therefore, he doesn't need the sin, the attachment of sin by wearing the sandal. Yeah. But it, I guess it falls because he doesn't say to Moses, take your clothes off because he doesn't do that. But No, but, you know, it. there is a beautiful picture. Um, in, in, there's a beautiful picture in these two occurrences, right? Um, between Moses removing his dirty sandals. Um, to step foot on holy ground and the Lord washing um, the disciples' feet and responding to Peter. Um, I have already, if those who have already taken a bath, those who've already been clean, you know, they don't need to be cleaned again, just their feet. Um, and this idea of, of um, the forgiveness of sins that is part and parcel to the, the very deliverance that the Lord is promising. I've seen my people. I know what they're, what's going on with them and they're mine and I, and I care. I think there's a, there's some symmetry there. I'm not saying that there's a direct connection yeah, and that I'm translating one to the other, but there's some really, there's some really neat symmetry between um, the two images. I think. As, yeah. As far as we know, there was no water on Mount Horeb to wash his feet. So no, no, <clears throat> no. I, and, and it's, it's still a beautiful picture, though, and I think and I think um, Moses understands it. Um, I think Moses, in his first Im- impression, and when he when he first hears the Lord speak and he knows who he is, um, he responds in in fear. But that fear doesn't let and and this maybe just in and I guess as a general thought tells us more about this is the person is more more um, supporting fact that this is the second person of the Trinity. Because the initial reaction is, okay, I'm afraid, but then there's this interaction that that takes place where where he, he he's so bold to even bring before the Lord in the burning bush all the excuses of why <laughs> I shouldn't go. Um, and yet when he's on Mount Sinai and he he sees the back of God Almighty, the Father Almighty, um, you know, he he can't even see. He can't even see any part of him because he would die. Um, so I think you see this beautiful difference between the persons of the Trinity playing out where, where you know, um, 
and I say this in the, I say this in 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 the beautiful nature of how our God presents Himself to us, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son is approachable. Um, I'm, yes, He's holy. Yes, there's that <clears throat> initial fear, right? Of of I'm I'm in this I'm in the presence of a holy God, but He's approachable. And I think Peter in the boat, um, you know, away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinner. We would um, st- yeah, we would still say that the the Lord appearing to Moses in the bush is still a Lord who's hiding himself. And I yes. like that picture of you're, you're getting to the heart of who, <clears throat> who our triune God is, which is what the disciples get as well as they interact with Jesus in all of his humility. He can, you know, he hides himself so much that you can really peer into and have a dialogue with uh, the God and the, the inner person of God, not the God in all of his might, but the, the, the inner however you want to say it, the inner voice. There you go. The inner voice of the word of that, yeah. that is our training God. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good point to bring out with people who, who want to see God, who, who want God to be more visible or more present in the world is you look at all the times in the old Testament where people do see God and they start arguing with it, you know, <laughs> like Jonah or, and my favorite is, is Ahaz. You know, when, when Isaiah comes to him and he says, God tells you to ask for a sign. And it has oh, no, his all, oh, no, 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 <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> like, people are stupid. If God appears to them, that, that's not going to work faith. You know, it's the gospel message. It's the means of grace. That's what works faith. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a good and, thought. Yeah. I'm just amazed at, you know, how sinful people can be to argue with God. Like, sure. how dumb is that? Uh, and, but it, but it does, doesn't that just, it, it, there is the beauty there that our Lord allows it. Well, that um, was going to be my second point. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I, I didn't. Um, no. Yeah. And that God puts up with it. Yeah, and, and he puts up with it for me. And, and the, and from what? like 8 billion people on earth right now. Right. I can't imagine. Can't. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it stands, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people are, have said, well, if God wanted it to be so, why didn't he just make it? Um, because the Lord doesn't, you know, the, 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 the case people have made, well, the Lord doesn't want robots. The Lord doesn't want, and I think it's this, the reality of, um, the Lord wants to show us his love and his caring for his people. Well, and more specifically, his caring for individuals. Right. If he had made a different world, he wouldn't have Will Harley. He, he wouldn't have Dave Rudat. He wouldn't have Katie Ray Crass. You know, he could have. Notice he, he kept himself in there. So he would have been there. <laughs> yes, if God would have made a perfect world, I would still exist. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking yeah, of God's great, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. And this is the comfort of the the doctrine of predestination. You know that you know ultimately, God from eternity was thinking. Christ, all of us. Yeah, he was, and, and was working to save all of us. And I don't know, I don't understand so much, but he's working to get us to heaven. Yep. Speaking of God's great patience, let's talk about First uh, Timothy chapter one, and uh, that's uh, twelve to seventeen. Dave, did you uh, do you use the English Heritage version or not? I, we do not. Okay. All right. So I was going to put the Bible. I I was going to put the First Timothy on there, but Dave, if you wouldn't wouldn't mind walking us through God uh, Timothy's and First Timothy chapter one, and uh, talk about your law and gospel, talk about things you uh, didn't uh, get to cover. And this will be time for those who have listened to Pastor Endorf's sermon. They they have questions or uh, insights about the sermon that they would also. Put that in the comments and we can respond. Well, here we seem to have run into something awkward. Okay. For some reason, my second meeting 
was Revelation 5, 11 to 14. Oh, okay. That was the old one. That's the old one. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we have three different sermons. Okay. All right. Yes. Now I'm all by myself. I can breathe a sigh of relief that the wrong Dave won't have a better sermon than me as he explains it now. So go ahead, Dave. What did you talk about today? Revelation 5? Revelation 5, 11 to 14. Um, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor, glory, and praise. Which is better than anything I said. Um, was that your sermon? That, huh? Was, was that your sermon? Yeah. <laughs> Much. Yeah. The, the introduction. That was better than anything I'm going to say. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> I just should have been. No, my introduction, it was, uh, you know, talking about when one of my professors first pointed out that, you know, a mo- most of the Bible was written by people who had committed murder. Moses and and David and Paul and you know that's what makes Christ worthy because God loves sinners and that as we are called to serve God we are called to uh, you know not to be gurus or life coaches or you name it <laughs> We are called to share the gospel message. And as we live our lives as Christians, you know, we're not there to be arrogant or or better than other people. You know, we're called to tell people, I'm forgiven. Um, Christ died for me. And that's why I worship him. Because there's this idea out there that, you know, we glorify God because, you know, God's this needy um, adolescent who uh, has to be worshipped or he doesn't feel good. And the reality is God doesn't command us to glorify him because he needs it. God commands us to glorify him because we need to do it. You know, this is how we proclaim the gospel to build ourselves up, to um, share it with the people around us who need to hear it, and so that other people can be saved, but also because God deserves it, because he's earned it. Um, And then the the (laughs) gospel portion was, you know, these are the words that John was given. 2,000 years ago, uh, so that for 2,000 years, the church would be encouraged to preach the blood of Christ and sins forgiven, to remind people that they are forgiven for the times when they've been arrogant and proud, that you are washed clean from all of the times when you forgot to share the gospel, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who sits on the throne to intercede for you with forgiveness and love because he's called sinners to be his church and his voice in the world, and he will never leave you or forsake you. And so we worship him. Thank you, Dave. Um, We were just talking on Monday. We were having a, we had a book study about um, not it was a, we were reading a book about the care of souls and talking about preaching about Christ or preaching Christ to our people, and that was a perfect example of you preaching Christ to us just at that moment. Thank you. Um, so, anything in that sermon that you did not pick up on or wished you would have talked about the whole book of Revelation? You would have been like, "Hey, it would have been great. To, <laughs> it would have been great to give you some context here, but." Yeah, well, and context is one of the things. I didn't put it much in, into the context of, you know, the the his the history of what was going on or following the letters um, to the churches. You know, I, I didn't talk about the 
the thousands upon thousands or the ten thousands to give people that understanding of how many people were going to be around us in heaven. And I, I think that, you know, that would have been comforting to know. You know, we got a smaller congregation kind of surrounded by 80,000 very liberal people. And, you know, I was kind of hitting myself afterwards that I could have pointed out. You know, it may feel like a small congregation, but you're in fellowship with these. Uh, yeah, thousands upon thousands. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you, you guys are going to be the ones that are singing at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of that singing, you know, it's um, interesting, you know, how you had sort of explained in your sermon that the, the Lord commands our praise. Um, and you made it very clear, which is true. The Lord doesn't need us to praise him. Um, <clears throat> but the command to praise, do you find that more that, that the Lord is commanding that? Because that is, that is the expression of value. That that the that the the Lord well you could go to Augustine and and say what he says that the the Lord gives what he commands and so um, if he commands us to pray he gives us reason to praise um, this is the the expression of value um, uh, when I use something over and over and over again it's the expression of it is valuable to me when I when I um, when I walk arm in arm with my wife it is an expression of value to me. Um, and so if I, you know, if I didn't do those things, I am not sharing that expression, right? I, I'm, how valuable is she? He doesn't even walk with her. He walks ahead of her. He doesn't hold her hand. You know, there, there's this, I, so I'm wondering if, if the command is less of the command of do this because you must do this for yourself, but do this because this shows your, this shows the value of, that you hold for it. Um, and therefore, I will give you the reason, every reason for value. Um, yeah, I, I think it's all of that. Um, you know, I, I think it's because, you know, we need to do it as believers. You know, we were created to have that relationship with God, you know, to be thankful, to praise God. Um and that when we don't, like Augustine says, our, our heart is wandering. I think it's there for other people that we can demonstrate it to them. You know, I think it's there to, um, uh, you know, because God is worthy of it. And so that that action in and of itself is a demonstration of you know, just the reality of what needs to be expressed because of of God's actions and the necessity there. Well, and I, I just, I guess, I take it a step further and say, you know, that is, it is, it is the expression because we praise everything, anything we value, we praise. Anything that we use all the time, we praise. Yeah. So it is a natural, and like you said, that is man is created to be a praise giving creature. <laughs> we are, yeah. we, we naturally praise everything we find a value. And, and so the Lord says, praise me because I am of the most value to you. And I, I think this is the sinful nature that <laughs> looks at it and, and doesn't even understand that has to be taught to praise God. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you don't have to be taught. You don't have to be taught to praise the Broncos sitting you on your do not. They are awesome. Which is a horrible, horrible thing. I thought we banned that from the show. <laughs> you tried, yeah. but yeah, it's, if we're going to ban things that trigger other people, <clears throat> I would not be here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, no, and, and as, you're, as you're talking about that. You know, this is the whole reason people struggle so much with the, the Lord's Prayer. You know, why does God have to teach us to pray for his name to be holy? Isn't his name holy without us praying for it? Yes. The problem's not with God. It's with you. It's with you. That. But The problem that. is, I don't know, know enough to pray for the right stuff. And I'm praying for the wrong stuff. And so God's not saying, hey, pray for it so I remember to keep my name holy. I need the reminder. He's saying, you idiot, 
stop praying for stupid stuff. Pray for the right stuff. And and there's yeah. interesting enough, he didn't have to um he didn't have to encourage people to pray. He had to encourage them to pray in the right way. Yes. <laughs> people people pray all the time for yeah. all the wrong things and to all the wrong things. Um so I mean you have it, it, interesting there that that there's that interesting um part of the sinful nature that understands godly things and yet completely repurposes them. So that's, that's a very interesting, I liked it. That's a, that would have been a, I should maybe go back and listen. Mm -hmm. We'll see. So, uh, I preached on first Timothy chapter one. And since I am the guy with the flashy buttons, we're going to see it. I'll read it. Well, I thought I was going to read it. And come on. And See, this is what happens when you brag that your flashy buttons work. Yeah. <clears throat> First Timothy 1, 12, it says, I give thanks to the one who empowered me, namely Christ Jesus our Lord, for that he treated me as trustworthy, pointing me into his ministry. I, he did this even though I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, and a violent man, but I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord overflowed on me along with the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and worthy of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But I was shown mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst sinner, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his unlimited patience as an example for those who are going to believe in him, resulting in eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, the Immortal, Invisible, Only God, be honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. So the way that I uh, took this uh, sermon, I took it in three parts. I encouraged members to think of themselves as part of, in God's, in Paul's story. There's a lot of characters throughout the Bible that we can associate with, but we don't, we don't always associate everything with every character, but we are we find things that we can find connections. And so I was encouraging them to see themselves in Paul's story, first of all, as ones who are recipients of God's grace. So I talked a lot about the worst of sinners concept and how the Apostle Paul doesn't compare himself to anybody else, but he compares himself to God's holy law and says, uh, God's holy law tells me I'm a sinner, and, and I'm, therefore I'm a worst of sinners because I'm comparing myself to him. My specific law in there was how we oftentimes compare ourselves with everybody else. We think I'm not so bad. Um, so then see yourself in Paul's story as someone who has been chosen by God's grace, that God showed you his unmerited favor. Uh, see yourself also in, as, so you think of your, God chose you to be saved. God worked that salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and through the means of grace. Now you are also a recipient of God's patience. And so we talked a little bit about God's patience, that can, um, ongoing patience that Paul has. Paul was talking about, also, that we also have a God who is consistently patient with us. Uh, on times we are, are not who we, we're not the best version of ourselves. And so God continues to be patient with us. So law, we're not, the, we're, we're not trying. The gospel, he continues to be patient with us. And the third point was talking about the ministry. He considers himself worthy uh, to be in the ministry. And then I was talking about how God has given us a opportunity to share the the good news of Jesus with those around us. That's our ministry. We have, yes, we have pastors who serve in the public ministry. Uh, the Apostle Paul was talking about his apostolic ministry, but our ministry is to share the gospel in, in some way, shape, or form. And I was really directing it towards the vocational aspect of ministry where not that, <clears throat> not talking about God has called you to go knock on doors, but God has called, put people in your life that need to hear about Jesus in some way, shape, or form. And so that is your ministry by uh, showing sharing the gospel with them. Tried to cover all that in 14, 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I, I, if I would have had more time, I would have talked more about what does it mean to have a ministry just to try to try to dispel the ideas that people want to have a ministry outside of their vocation and say, you know, you have a vocation and this is your opportunity to choose shared Christ in that vocation. Uh, there is going to be uh, people that you're around that will benefit from hearing the gospel as well. So that was my, I don't think I was as clear as I could have been when we talked about um, ministry. What does that look like? So. I, I, did, I did listen to your sermon. Um, that one I did listen to. I made my wife listen to it as well. <clears throat> and um, uh, she, got I told you to, to she, she, she got did, to listen to it. She got to listen to it. 
Um, but I, I, and I told you this before, um, but my knee jerk reaction was, you know, instantly it was a three part sermon. Yeah. <laughs> and you have feelings about three part sermons. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it was very good. I, I thought you did a very good job of, of uh, bringing us into um, kind of understanding where Paul is and, and how he can say, I'm the worst of sinners. Uh, and then how we can we can say that too because and and I think one of the things that I thought was very good about your sermon, like I said, I did have an opportunity to listen to it is is you you kind of let us down the path of of recognizing it's not me versus someone else versus how does God look at us comparatively, but it's me versus God, and how does God see me and and who I am I, I think that's kind of a yeah. Sometimes we think that we have safer ground to stand on because we are comparing ourselves, like you said, ourselves with the other person. Yeah. I if if I were to preach it again, I would probably talk about more about the gender thing, like uh um we can uh, we can find we can associate with characters in the Bible who are female and the, those and the females in our you you can associate with yourself with being male without getting all kinds of confused and stuff because we're it's really about our relationship with God, not about our particular gender roles. Yeah. So did you um very briefly, I would suppose, did you is there something in the text that you wish you would have done better? Um maybe handled it better? I mentioned or? that already. Um well, I mean I you every sermon you have to pick on something. You, like especially the Apostle Paul. You can't preach on everything he talks about because it would just take forever. You have to pick on pick on those topics. So I did. I, I chose those three things: the um, worst of sinners concept, the unlimited patience concept, and the ministry concept. So those are the three concepts that I was going to talk about. There's there's a plenty that you could talk about in the text that I didn't get to. Um, you know, the acting ignorantly in unbelief didn't didn't have any opportunity to talk about that. Um, uh, I did talk a little bit what about what does it mean to be a blasphemer? How was Paul a blasphemer? Just because sometimes I, I've noticed mem- members are like, what does it mean to blaspheme? Because they hear that every once in a while in the Bible about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? I talked a little bit about that, but I could have could have spent more time on that as well. So, did you feel um, it being a three part sermon? Did you feel that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were biting off a little bit more than <laughs> you should have chewed. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sense a platform that you are <laughs> trying to advocate. <clears throat> I don't. It, it's up to my members to to let me know. So, was it all right that I covered three things, three concepts, rather than just? Well, I'm one? not saying it's not all right. I'm just saying that. Did you feel that? Um, that that having three sections and then doing it in a time allotted or at least in a tam- a timely fashion that you if you were going to sit down and write it again would you say okay i th- i think i'm going to stick with these three or would i narrow it down to two or yeah i'm not sure how i would do that again um i those were the three concepts i really felt i wanted god's people to see i wanted to see the whole them to see the worst of sinners concept could we have I had an, a, an old lady that passed away that she loved this. She wanted me to preach on this one. And she was like the nicest lady you have ever seen, you know, the one that makes the, makes the cookies and is always generous and all of these things where everyone would say that's the nicest lady ever. And she wanted to preach, me to preach on this one, uh, the worst of sinners. And like, how can you preach on that with her? Well, of course, she recognized this was uh, Paul comparing himself to God's holy law rather than... Um, everybody else and she was doing the same where the focus is not on her what she, her righteousness that people could perceive but on Christ's righteousness for her uh would I have I, I wanted to talk about the patience because we have uh, you know people in the congregation who might feel like God has given up on them and you say no God hasn't given up on you so he's got unlimited patience the patience of of our God is still there for you and then the whole idea of the ministry aspect of trying to move members to be more aware of the ministry opportunities in front of them. So you have to talk about 
I felt all three of those concepts needed to be talked about. Whether it's going to be covered completely or not, at the end of the day, you go, okay, the Holy Spirit's going to use one. <laughs> Hopefully he uses all three, but perhaps he's only using one or two. Give him a, a in, in this case, give him a smorgasbord, give him a buffet and see what happens. Very good. It's Very like good. a bonus like I said, segment. I heard it. I did Three listen parts to it. It's like a, a bonus segment. Yeah, I don't. <clears throat> I, I did listen to it, and and I thought it was a, a good sermon. I'm just razzing you about having two parts. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I could take it. I got big shoulders. I, mean, I got a big head, even. I mean, my big head is not going to be affected by razzing. That's a lot for people to try to grasp. Three I know. It's, you try parts. <laughs> you try to you In try one to take sermon. Out, <laughs> I, so I respect part. I respect my people that are sitting there in the pews that they can handle it. Three distinct parts. <laughs> the triggered has been triggered. The triggerer has been triggered. So, I think what Will's confessing now is partialism. Partialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, and everyone else listening is like, what's partialism? I have abs- <laughs> So, yeah. no, very good. Um, so next week, um, beyond the sermon, uh, I, I would love to say I know exactly what I'm going to be preaching on, and I have absolutely no idea yet. So I am but, not preaching at all. So <laughs> I will be a facilitator for beyond the sermon. <laughs> partialism, Patrick. <laughs> That is very good. Thank you. Partialism. That's partial. Nineteen eighty TV show Voltron, Patrick. <laughs> All right. Well, now you should probably post that in the show notes so that people understand what we're referencing. Um, Lutheran satire. So. Well, yeah, I think we're kind of winding Tomlin, down Tomlin. here. We've got if any other any other questions or comments. Thank you very much for the comment on vocation. Yeah, I. I just that's just gold to me. Just that insight of uh, God has given us our vocation and has given us opportunities to serve others with Christ in those vocations, and um, yeah, it's awesome. It is okay. It is. And no one should say I'm like in in Rachel's case. No one should say I'm just a mom because moms have to do a little of everything. Yeah. So I mean, yep. No one is just one thing. Well, and I, I think that that's where it's good to study the image of God. You know, that when God gives the image in, in Genesis 1, 26, 27, when he talks about it, you know, he, he he connects it very distinctly to, you know, the actions of subduing the world and filling the world. And so all of those things of being a mom is part of the image of God. And, and when you understand that that work as a, a mom is a part of the image of God, you, know, you can't say I'm just a mom. You know, this is divine work. Um, you know, understand that in the proper context. I'm not talking about subjugating women or anything, but, you know, that we value moms appropriately. Well, it's all like, again, it comes back down to, you know, the tasks of living and what needs to be there for living are all a part of vocation. Um, I mean, that's all part of what God intended into the world, right? Uh, That we would work, that we would thrive, that we would grow, that we would participate in community, that we would raise the next generation. That's all part of it. So, no, very good. Um, so next week, beyond the sermon, uh, we'll try to be more on top of things. We'll have everything queued up. We'll start earlier and and run through the tests so that you don't have to watch it as we do it. Yeah, and I won't. God willing. Yeah, as as the right Dave, I won't make the wrong decision of of assuming that when someone says I preached the second lesson, that it was the same second lesson. So we'll get all. Well, there's only going to be two lessons next week. Only two. No, you're not preaching. I have no idea. What are, what's going on? What happens on Sunday? I have no idea. But you just said you weren't preaching. I won't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. All right. God go with you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>